So thanks very much, and it's great to be here. I'm going to begin by letting you know that I'm speaking from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So I push to audience, and I'm just pressing. Okay, so uh, it's great to be able to talk to you about the idea of how digita digitization is going to affect us. And I thought I'd look at it from the past as well as the present and into the future. So let's go back and think about the past. When I think of that, it's very natural to think about things that have changed in my own lifetime. And so I'm going to admit that I was born in the 1950s. And in that decade, Australia was actually filled with an enormous amount of innovation. And it has actually laid the groundwork for so much that's come since then. For example, the uh, School of the Air started in 1951. So that was cutting edge radio education at the time. Uh, Australia's first computer, the Syriac, or Syriac, uh, provided computing services to all the CSRO from 1951 to 1955. And that was built by Trevor Percy, Maston Beard, and Jeff Hall in the late 1940s. And then 1955 saw the mass distribution of polio vaccine in Australia. And what we saw in that time were cuts from an annual um, number of cases of about one and a half thousand to just 125 in the first year alone, sort of reminiscent of what's happening now. And I should note that in my school that I went to, um, they were only beginning to start teaching senior science to girls at that time. So today, what's happening in 2000? Well, today, the School uh, of the Air relies on video conferencing and has a very sophisticated studio set up in Alice Springs. We've seen, uh, well, and I guess we also have to remember that uh, for many months, the video learning of so many Australian children has just been on that as well. So we've learnt a lot about education digitally. A defining feature of where we are today is the sheer unbelievable connectivity and ubiquitous smartphones, the computers and the Wi-Fi in our households and our pockets. We all probably have got a mobile phone within reach right now. And with that comes a level of computing power and information access we've just never seen before. And I want to make the distinction of what um, that is, so oh, hang on, I'll go back there, it's gone a bit forward, make a distinction that it's not just local or personal, but worldwide consideration that the sudden acceleration in remote networking solutions in response to the pandemic and our ability to speak instantly to those around the world, regardless of the location or the time zone. So 70 years ago, uh, we were rolling out Volio vaccine today it's the COVID vaccine and something that was developed in nine months compared to the usual 10 years to develop a vaccine. We saw even last night the uh, awarding of uh, Eddie Holmes with the, the uh, Prime Minister's Science Prize. And with that, uh, it was a consequence of him also sharing overnight and at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic was beginning, he was able to uh, share the genome sequence of the uh, virus and with that led to the great changes and development of vaccines. So where are we now? The future isn't written, obviously, and it's hard to really draw exact trends from the past and the, and the present into the decades ahead. And regardless of that, I do see themes in the areas of health, improvements to connectivity, and also new ways to see the access to the world around us. But there is a common thread above all, and that is the incredible and ubiquitous impact of digitization and the digital world. And throughout this conference, we are, as you've heard, talking about a child who is born now and how digital technologies will impact their lives. And I think it's important for us to give that person a name. So I actually went through digging around and realized that we had one ready-made, in fact, a whole family. Yes, it is. It's um, the Jetsons. They aired in, two, uh, in um, 1962, and it was set in uh, 2062. And there's the point. That means that George Jetson is scheduled to be born in 2022. So it's not today, but close enough. And uh, if we want to put a name to our child of the future, why not that one? So before we 
call me out, I do realise that The Jetsons is an old show and of course it's got very outdated gender roles, but it did lead me to thinking about things. So if the Jetsons will start to come into the world next year, we know they will live our time, in a time of rapid change. There's tremendous connectivity and massive technological upheaval. So how do we train them to live in a world where the technologies don't exist yet? And how do we prepare them for the careers that are still unnamed? And of course, I do have to ask the question is when we will in invent that flying car? Anyway. My key takeaway is this, that digital technologies and transformation is going to impact our lives even further. So digital technologies are already rapidly um, evolving and way beyond some of the science fiction dreams that we had yesterday and they're in, coming into reality today. So I want to consider our future industries and these are real and they're not make-believe and every single one of them relies on current and future technologies as and that require us to grow them if we want to see success there. First one is hydrogen, shipping our sunshine overseas as the newest clean renewable energy. Or space, the Australian Space Agency is aiming to triple the size of the Australian space industry by 2030 and with that bring along 20,000 new jobs. Um, in artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the jobs of, uh, by 2024, only three years away, is expected to grow by a quarter of a million. And with the digital technology um, tech workforce expected to be the largest workforce in Australia within the next few years. And in quantum, we're seeing huge potential for the emerging quantum technology industry. And I want to talk about that a bit more in a moment. But even with those industries already underway, looking at the future is bigger than that. And I'm hoping to throw some ideas out that came to me when I started wondering about the next decade or two and what will bring them um, forward. So the first one is brain machine interfacing, the idea of biological computers. Next is new ways of working and, virtual com in, and the virtual commute. As digital enables home working to be the norm, how will we adapt to this enormous change in our life patterns? Where do we draw the line between work and life barrier? And will we be in, or will it be normal to work on a different continent, say to your theoretical head office? And will there be a head office? And we've seen already that COVID's massively accelerated the discussion that has previously happened before. Next thing is automation. It's worthwhile um, to think about, will we actually be not owning cars in the future but will we be in fact buying into a consortium or just renting a um, self-driving car that we just call up on demand? And of course, thinking about defense and security. What will wars of the future be like? Will there be a human pulling the trigger? Or can our social media algorithms be weaponized? And among all these hypotheticals, we do need to consider digital ethics and also social license. All of these questions are, and all these future technologies, they won't go anywhere on their own. And one of the things I just want to raise is the importance that whenever we're talking about new technologies, we need to think about what I call as science plus. And that is we need to have science plus the engineering. We need to have the science plus user design and the user interface. Science plus the right business model because we've seen any new digital technology coming in actually has often brought with it a whole new way of engaging um, economically. There's also, of course, science plus the regulation and policy in this settings that are needed, the social license, and of course, the marketing, which allows us to be able to actually recognize what's available. And they all need to be talking to each other all of the time. I want to just spend a few minutes talking about an area I am championing, and that's quantum. I think it's the next industry for Australia. These technologies can do things such as accelerate drug and materials development for healthcare, enhance national security and support defense, increase productive mineral exploration and water resource management for mining and other sectors, improve secure communications for industries like space, and create optimization processes, say for finance and logistics. And it's happening already. We're seeing with some of the, um, the 
uh, computers that are underway now, which are um, noisy, uh, um, intermediate scale quantum computers that are available via the cloud, where we're seeing Airbus designing wings with, with these computers, or Deutsche Bank using them to do transport efficiency algorithms. But progress doesn't just happen by accident. Now let's look at Moore's law. It's often quoted um, as the observation that a number of components in integrated circuits doubles every 12 months. Now this was an observation that was made by Gordon Moore in a paper in, um, in 1965. And it's a remarkably insightful paper. It also includes the lines, integrated circuits will lead to such wonders as home computers, or at least terminals connected to a central computer, automatic controls for automobiles, and personal portable communications equipment. His observation was not driven by any actual particular scientific or engineering necessity, but it was a reflection on just how things happened to turn out. The silicon industry, uh, chip industry, actually took note of this and adopted it as a goal, a target that the entire industry could hit. And so as a consequence, what we've seen is that um, if we want to get the most out of digital technologies, we usually need to give ourselves stretch targets to meet them. And this is something which I'm really observing right now as we're um, seeing a plethora of new quantum technologies being considered, being uh, pushed out from research into industry and then just taking off. I think it's going to be really interesting to see where that ends up in the near term. So to finish off, I just want to say that in short, things are changing rapidly. And the challenge and the opportunity there is there for us to take. So here's the Jetsons of the future and us as uh, people who are going to adopt where we think are the right <coughs> the social license to be able to make sure it's right and to make sure that any digital technologies we do adopt or are actually thrust upon us are ones that really will make a difference for good. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Cathy. Uh, we, we ask the presenters to dig deep and to really stretch themselves to think about the future. And I also said that today was going to be the fun day. Today, this is the setup to help us think our way into what the future will actually look like. So after Cathy's perspective, we now have uh, Professor Hugh Durrant White, who's, going, who's the New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer, who's going to pre present a different perspective on the role of science and technology underpinning that digital age. Hugh, over to you. Yeah, good morning, uh, Ian, and good morning, uh, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. I wonder if I could have the start slide, please. Good. So um, I guess over the last 40 years, I've been working in the field of um, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, and particularly its application in robotics and autonomy. So I thought I'd take my 10 minutes to really, I guess, reflect on uh, the past and the future of AI and what perhaps its implications could be, because certainly AI received an awful lot of press coverage uh, um, and, and uh, is often underpinned by a lot of interesting and new technologies. Next slide, please. So I think it was also useful to start by understanding what AI is. People use, uh, throw the term AI around with something of an abandon, um, but AI has actually been around a very long time. There's a picture over on the left there I dug out from the archives of a guy called Frank Rosenblatt, who invented, the, in fact, the first neural network uh, back in 1953. Um, so let's be clear here, AI as a field in neural networks, what we think is sort of new, has actually been around now for getting on for 70 years. So uh, even older than I am uh, in terms of uh, where things are. And when I was first learning about AI, I remember reading my first ever book on AI, The Introduction to AI by Patrick Winston. And Patrick Winston was the first director of the AI lab at MIT. So he really was in there at the beginning. And I still use his quote a great deal. Uh, and he said, what is AI? AI is anything we currently cannot do. When we know how to do it, it's called an algorithm. Uh, what he's really trying to say is there's nothing special about AI different from what other sites of computer science do. And yet at the other end, we've heard a lot of what I would call grandstanding around AI. So here's a particular one I sometimes like from Vladimir Putin. Uh, AI is the future for all humankind. Whoever is the leader in this sphere will be the ruler of the world. Um, and in contrast to that, 
Andrew Nee, who is uh, from Stanford, a professor at Stanford, and also a founder of some very famous uh, AI companies. And he said in Wired, I worry about AI superintelligence in the same way I worry about overpopulation on Mars. I, it will happen one day, but in such a distant future uh, that he's no longer concerned about it. Uh, next slide, please. So I think pragmatically, when you think about AI, AI is not pixie dust. It is not some kind of magic. It is basically data. It is algorithms and the way that those are put together to solve problems uh, and applications. And I think the interesting future for AI, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more in the, in the next couple of overheads, is really the great applications that are being un, uh, really rethought about uh, by AI and also the kinds of new discoveries in science and the changes that will come, I think, in the lifetime of the child that is born today. Next slide, please. I do want to emphasize the kind of difference or disparity between what the experts in the field uh, know about AI and what I think uh, at the moment, unfortunately, the general public, even the educated general public, think about AI. The picture over on the left there is actually a survey that was conducted at some of the most prestigious conferences in AI. And it basically shows how long people, that is experts in the field, think it will take for AI to reach the level of human intelligence. And interestingly, more than half of the people in the field think it will not happen in 100 years. Just let me repeat that. The experts in the field think it will not happen in the lifetime of this child. Okay, so that's quite an important thing because what it really says is, although we think of AI as intelligent, it isn't yet by a long, long way. Okay, and I put a little cartoon over there, uh, which kind of reflects sometimes my conversations with the general public uh, Wally is basically saying, I built an MVP, a minimal viable product. And the pointy head boss says, well, that's just a block of wood. And uh, Wally says, no, I call it artificial intelligence. And the pointy head boss says, what's its middle name? And Wally says, well, it's shy, just like people. And the pointy head boss says, it has emotions. So you get my picture here. Sometimes I think we're a little bit credulous about what AI can actually do. And I also mention here Michael Jordan, uh, who is the most highly cited researcher in AI. Uh, so he is, if you like, the expert in the field. And he's often said that AI really is not a science or anything special, it's an engineering problem. And we're really still at the very early stages of AI in terms of how we actually build significant AI systems. So while, as he says, uh, the science fiction discussions about AI and superintelligence are fun, they're a distraction. There's not been really enough focus on how we build large scale machine learning systems that really work and deliver value to us as humans and also that do not amplify inequities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, there's a very long history behind AI. I don't expect you to read all the details here. But the other thing to realize is, you know, it's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, AI has been around for a long time. There have been many applications. Uh, you can see there those two little peaks. Those were called the AI winters, where basically people who had hyped AI gradually realized that it wouldn't work. Uh, and I suspect that we're actually near an AI winter now in the sense that, you know, there's been lots of predictions for what uh, things like neural networks will do. And now, interestingly, in the last two or three years, there's been a lot of papers on basically the fundamental limitations on those kinds of approaches. And I think it'll be a long time, I'm afraid to say, uh, uh, um, uh, to people, uh, before we will see a self-driving car in the city of Sydney without a steering wheel. Probably not in my lifetime is the answer. So what is the AI future? Let's look at the next slide here. I think this is interesting, right? AI is already changing things, and we do see that all over the place. But it is changing things where we've got what we call weak AI, lots of data, decisions which are just yes or no, some very predictable outcomes. What we're not really good at yet is what we would like to think of as strong AI, where there is very little data, where the decisions to be made are not obvious at all, and where there's very high levels of uncertainty. And as yet, truthfully, we don't even really have the mathematics or the understanding as to how to build algorithms uh, to manage that kind of problem. And I mentioned Rod Brooks, very famous guy in the autonomy area here. He says just about every successful deployment of AI has either used one of two expedients. There's a person in the loop, or the cost of failure for a blunder is very low. So we see AI in areas where, you know, I'm predicting what things you will buy on the internet. That's fine. 
but you do not see AI out there driving cars through the city of Sydney at this point, and we probably won't in the future. And we still have people sitting in the driver's seat for good reasons. So there will be impacts in autonomy and automation. There will be impacts in job replacement and elimination of work. But I will say, I think possibly the most important thing that we need to be concerned about, or not concerned about, but hopeful for, is the fact that AI, even at this point, is beginning to revolutionize science and society, in my view, in a very, very positive way. Next slide. So I picked up on three examples that I think for me just show what's possible. Uh, last September, DeepMind, a company in London owned by Google, announced uh, uh, that they would won a competition uh, to predict uh, protein structure uh, using an algorithm called AlphaFold. And AlphaFold uses some AI techniques called reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. They are basically simply applied statistics. It's not anything, again, pixie dust. But what really is interesting about this is that AlphaFold can predict with precision every protein in the human body. That is absolutely transformational. It will revolutionize medicine. And I don't think people realize uh, in the medical community what this has just done. This has changed the whole way we will think about medicine, about health, about synthetic biology, everything in the future. And so AI is genuinely having a, will have a transformational impact on discovery in this space. Next overhead. Here is in fact a system I worked on myself. Unfortunately, I think the last picture has gone missing in action in the display. Uh, but this is really, again, using machine learning, using AI, to make discoveries in minerals. This is an area that, you know, 10 years ago, people would not have thought of at all. But now there's so much data out there. Uh, the problems in terms of modeling about how to put that information together has transformed itself. And there are systems out there like Obsidian, which in fact we developed, uh, which actually will predict with accuracy the depth uh, and geological mineralization right across an entire continent. And there are now many companies out there doing very, very similar things. Again, this will transform what we do in geology and in mineral discovery in general. Next slide. The other one that I think is really interesting is how we use AI to understand complex human problems. This is actually an example from my wife who works in this area. Uh, and it's really about trying to understand the drivers for disengaged and vulnerable youth, and also to try and predict the life course of those people and understand what impacts you can have by different types of interventions. And I think the point here is this is supremely complex. This is not a trivial problem. If there are 500 factors available for predicting what that person will do in the future, then there are two to the 500 possible combinations of these factors. So there are more ways, more models for how a person will progress through their life than there are atoms in the universe, okay? And at the moment, our standard AI techniques are incapable of managing that many combinations. And indeed, in this example, uh, all the top 100 combinations produce exactly the same predictions. So we, in fact, do not know what we're doing at all in this area. But nevertheless, new types of mathematics, new types of AI, if you'd like to use that expression, are driving our ability to use data to make uh, informed decisions about the ways that we can actually improve the human condition. And I think that that will also have a terrific impact on what we will see in the lifetime of this person born today. So last slide. So let me dispel the dystopia. Um, I think there is so much more that AI will yet do. I think in some sense, the Googles, the Facebooks, all of these sorts of things are a distraction at this point. What will really happen with AI is it will transform science. It will transform discovery. It will just transform the way that we work in this world, all, in my view, to a positive effect. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. I, I have I, to say, uh, uh, Hugh and Kathy are still very different, very different perspectives on the impact of, of science and technology in the future world. And I think, importantly, Kathy highlighted some technological advancements in particular quantum computing, which will change the way we do things. 
Here's what's highlighted. The really important that is that the limits of what's possible. And it's important for us as we think our way into this future environment to be clear about what, what is possible, what's likely, and in fact what's not possible. And understanding what's not possible is just as important as being able to understand likely scenarios. Let me let's go back to you. You said that AI will transform the way we do discovery. What what do you mean by that? Just help us. So I think the best example is in fact the alpha fold one. You know, uh, people have been trying to predict protein folding for 50 years um, because understanding the structure of protein tells you what they will do and how they will work, and therefore what proteins you need to tackle if you're building a vaccine, what protein you need to design in lots of other areas, and so on. And yet, what AI has done is it is now being able to predict every single protein, the structure of every single protein in the human body, and what's more, predict the structure of any protein from any sequence of amino acids. Okay? So the whole process now of discovering vaccines, of discovering mechanisms, of discovering new types of ways that life works and so on, uh, can be tackled using these new techniques. It is transformational. And does that have implications for the nature of research, the, the nature of investigation? Uh, is, is the future of research an algorithm sorts through data and points out something interesting and then researchers say that's something I'll take further? Or what's the Absolutely not. A absolutely not. And I think that's part of the challenge at the moment, right, is that is what I think was the traditional way of doing science. You get a part of data and you then search through the data to confirm or deny a hypothesis you already have. Okay. I think the whole point about discovery is on the contrary, is to really understand the space of models, e.g. the way things fold as proteins, the way geology works as geologies, uh, the way humans evolve in terms of you know, the environment they work in and so on. And use data to understand which of those most likely explain the data. And that is discovery. That's quite different from hypothesis testing. And I think there needs to be a transformation in science to really begin to adopt these things. And I'm not sure science is as ready for it as the machine learners are. Thank you. I'm going to pass to Kathy now. What was really interesting about, one of the things that was very interesting about what she presented was what's not possible. And essentially looking to put limits on, on the, the range of possible future scenarios. We talked about the, this journey of the child living to be 100 years old. If you made some statements about this will not be possible within 100 years or within uh, the next few decades. Going to, to, to quantum in particular, quantum is another area that, that there are very, very broad views about the art of the possible. What, what do we think quantum really can do and what, what can quantum not do? What will quantum not change? What, what, is, what is the, the arc of influence of, of quantum? And, and I acknowledge that's a pretty unfair question, but Kathy, I'll offer to no, you. No, look, I get where you're coming from. I, look, it's still, I, I don't think I can answer where, where, the, where it can and where it can't. I think what we have to see right now is that we're beginning to see the evolution of what was done in laboratories where we're able to control quantum states which weren't possible before, but because of technology developments, being able to control um, you know, sort of uh, quantum states in ways we couldn't before, build machines that are able to have them in a stable state for periods of time that we can do something with those quantum states is still pretty new. But the thing that's interesting is then how do we turn it into something like a um, uh, something that can do computing for us, which allows us to uh, go up and, uh, and either in some cases do it faster, in other cases actually doing uh, computations in ways which you can't currently do, which has only just there's, you know, what they call either quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. And at this stage, it's still uh, had occasional demonstrations of that, that super ability or that, that um, conceived idea. So there's a, and there's a wide range of views as to when that will turn up, whether it's going to be you know, in three years' time or never is, is sort of the, the, the range at the moment because there's some people who feel that a quantum computer will never work I, uh, because they think that you just can't get to a point where you can control 
uh, quantum state in that um, at, at, at that point where you can do multiple calculations at the same time, which gives it that accelerating um, cap capacity. But regardless, what we're seeing is the ability of um, of new technologies, which are based on you know uh, ability to control quantum states, is allowing us to do better sensing. It's allowing us to do uh, some acceleration in, in uh, with even current classical computers which uh, will allow us to do computations faster. Uh, in theory, when we're hearing about the, the, um, the range of possibilities in, in human nature of where we have choices and what, what pathway one could choose, uh, and it's being you know, more than the atoms of the universe, that's the sort of big questions which if we were able to get a quantum computer to operate, they're the sorts of things where we will get the advantage, uh, even just climate, um, uh, since it's top, a topical thing at the moment, climate um, uh, modeling is limited by uh, you know, just the, um, the, the compute power you've got in your in your supercomputers. So, if we were able to do more complex modeling, that would give us the potential to have you know sort of a, a way of modeling reality uh, in a way that might be closer to the truth. Because you've got to remember, any model is only as good as the design of it, the parameters you choose. And I think quite often we think that um, that models are everything, but but hopefully you know when we are able to have more powerful computers, we will be able to um, have models that are closer to reality. So when you ask the question of where the boundaries are, um, it's it's impossible to say. But one of the things which I've noticed and and you've seen over history is when you have a whole lot of people who are focused on a problem, putting their brains into it together collectively. Uh, we actually see pretty significant shifts in, in in the hardware side of things. So we're able to make the machines that can actually do uh, things which are pushing what's possible digitally. Thanks, Kathy. I've, I've got some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, given the amount of time, I'm going to try and compress them to, to something. What we're trying to do today is help people think in, create a model to help us think through the next decades, uh, 2030, 2050 and beyond. The questions being asked are around uh, AI and the, the bias associated with AI training on white males from Western countries, for example, is a very famous facial recognition example. Let me ask you both, when will we come to grips with use of data and understand bias and understand biased algorithms? When will we have enough protections and understanding of how to use data similar to the way we use electricity today. When will it be when will we understand enough of our data to use it safely so that we understand biases and understand potential harms? Uh, Hugh, I might start with you. <laughs> Look, uh, I think the first thing which you've actually sort of done in your question, uh, but to be clear with the audience, is there's a big difference between AI as an algorithm and the data you put into it. Right. AI as an algorithm in many senses is not biased or unbiased or anything, really. It's not ethical or unethical. It's an algorithm. Um, what is difficult is, you know, if you take that algorithm that, say, classifies things and you train it on a set of data, which comprises only one class, then you will end up with an answer which basically classifies everything in that class, if you see what I mean. So it's the data part that really raises the ethics issues rather than the algorithm side. OK, um, in, in, in all of these sorts of things. Now, you know, uh, with one exception, which I won't go into because it's a bit technical, but nevertheless. So the data side of things, it's interesting. As um, Ian, as you know, my wife is a statistician and she looks at this and she says, well, statisticians have been dealing with bias for so long. It's not funny. You know, we need to sample the complete space in a way that's representative of the space that we wish to make decisions on if we are to end up with you know a regression function a clustering algorithm which genuinely will lead to good outcomes in the future it's not rocket science perhaps the one thing we really need to do if we're going to address bias in ai is to make sure everyone gets trained in statistics when they're at school all right and then people might have an appreciation of the way data drives these decision making processes and i have to say i find it hard to move away from that view not only because my wife would complain if I did, uh, but because, to be honest, there's a lot of truth in that. I go to machine learning conferences, uh, you know, or I go to people talk about AI, and I ask, well, what data did you train this on? And it's a great example of an algorithm people trained and published a paper on, which tried to distinguish between criminals and non-criminals. And it turned out that when you know you actually went and looked at it, they had actually trained it 
to detect people whether they were smiling or not. And the people who weren't smiling were from prisons. <laughs> so my point is, it's good statistics that drives it more than anything else. And I don't think you should try and pretend that it's anything more, much more than that at this point. Now, the decision-making piece is something else, but I'm going to stop there and let Kathy have a view. Uh, actually, uh, I'm a big fan of statistics and I'm really concerned that we aren't teaching it enough. And in fact, we're seeing too many statistic schools being closed down in universities. So that's a big flag for me. And I know there's a group of people who are really keen to see if we can get more statistics into our education system. So because I think that is absolutely the, the way forward is actually understanding what um, what does it mean when we're talking about um, making decisions and who are we considering? And it's human nature uh, or it's the way we're so, um, socialised that means that we, we have this truckload of unconscious bias. And being able to set things up and have a logical way to be able to make sure we could cut through that is absolutely critical. But another thing which I want to add is transparency. I think uh, quite often a lot of the things which are uh, being done yeah, from a digital perspective, uh, things done behind uh, AI systems, behind search engines or any in, uh, social media engagement or any, you know, often our, our way of engaging with things digital are hidden behind um, some, some level of decision making that we don't have a choice of what parameters they are, they are using when they're deciding to push things in front of me when, say, I'm searching for something on the internet. So they're the sorts of things which I would love to see is that um, working towards the transparency so don't, uh, there's a level of A, understanding, so there's education, B, transparency so we know what's going on, and, and then the other one is actually having those um, ethical constraints that we as a, a, a you know, society agree on, you know, how we're going to manage the, these technologies and uh, you know, the whole opportunities they offer but also that we make sure that they're used in a way that will allow us all to um, feel that we're safe and, um, and that there isn't bias there that means that some are disadvantaged. Thank you very much, Cathy. We're right on time. And so I will say thank you to Cathy and Hugh. Uh, I think we've been really honoured today to have Australia's chief scientist and New South Wales government's chief scientist and engineer offer us a perspective. It would be interesting as we think through the next few decades that if some of the answer was actually just doing the stuff that we've been doing all this time was part of the, the approach to how we address the future. So thank you very much, Hugh and Kathy, for, for setting us up.